Hello, hello. I'm Celeste, and this is Week by Week. On today's episode, I start with an update about why today's topic is so near and dear to my own heart. And later on, our guest is the wonderful Jenna Overbaugh. Let's do this. Our episode topic today is one that's near and dear to my heart personally, and that is the topic of OCD. I personally started experiencing little rituals and compulsions in elementary school, but I didn't have words for it. I didn't know what it was, and it didn't feel like something I could explain to somebody. In early high school, my OCD really started to grow, and it was pretty intense up through my early 20s until I started therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy to get some tools to navigate what was going on. There are so many different types of support out there, and it's important to find what works for you. But for me, having a better understanding of OCD, what it was, how it functioned, and ways to reframe these thoughts or exposures to start to move past some of these patterns I was locked into was all really helpful. I also, until I started investigating OCD for myself, I didn't realize how expansive it was and how many different forms it could take on. And when I started to realize that OCD looks like a lot of different things, I found it really relieving. It was helpful for me to learn that OCD could look like fear of contamination, fear of harm. It could look like behaviors like checking and checking and checking either on your body or checking to make sure the door is locked, the stove is turned off, but repeated behaviors to try to eliminate a nagging fear, thought, or anxiety. Our guest actually outlines her experience with some checking behaviors that I think really illustrate the experience wonderfully, so I'll let her do the talking. But the top of our episode had some technical difficulties So we jump right into the conversation. And because of that, I wanted to offer some quick definitions right up at the top that her and I covered that I think are helpful for contextualizing the conversation. So just generally, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, as defined by the Mayo Clinic, is a pattern of unwanted thoughts and fears, parentheses, obsessions, that lead to repeated behaviors, parentheses, compulsions. These obsessions and compulsions interfere with daily activities and cause significant distress. It says you might try to stop these obsessions, but that only increases your distress and anxiety. Ultimately, you feel driven to perform compulsive acts to ease your stress. This leads to ritualistic behavior, which is the cycle of OCD. I wanted to also talk about intrusive thoughts. Intrusive thoughts are so tricky because everybody has intrusive thoughts. This is not unique to somebody with OCD. The difference is if you don't have OCD, you have a weird or strange thought that just floats into your head and then it floats out and you don't really give it a second consideration. With OCD, those intrusive thoughts can start a cycle of, I don't want this thought, so I try to push it away. And then you need to do a ritual to keep it away, as I was describing with the you know compulsions. Or it can start with just questioning of why am I having this thought and I don't like this thought and what does this thought say about me? And then you just start spiraling. The more you try to push it away, the more they persist. Our guest mentions also that OCD has a way of attaching itself to the things you love and care about the most. I think that's such an excellent point because that's one of the things that makes it so scary. She also mentions a term that she wants everybody who thinks they might be struggling with OCD to return to and keep in their back pocket, and that's ego dystonic thoughts, which are what OCD thoughts are. They are inconsistent with your character and your values, and they're not thoughts you want to have. These are unwanted thoughts. I will be honest, I did not think when I was at the height of my struggles with OCD that it could get better, but it did with a lot of hard work and a lot of support. But I know how scary and isolating it is. And I think that that's a real trick of OCD is it keeps you in your thoughts and fears and it isolates you. 
And I know a lot of times I felt like I was hiding in plain sight where I was really struggling or dealing with OCD thoughts and then just going about my everyday life and acting like nothing was wrong. And a lot of people had no idea that this was anything that I was struggling with. And I just want to say you're not alone if you're struggling with OCD. It does get better, even if it feels really heavy right now. I feel fortunate that I didn't experience OCD around postpartum, but I am so deeply grateful for people like our guest, Jenna Overbaugh, who are speaking out about their experience. So let's talk about our guest a little bit. Jenna is a licensed professional counselor, and she's been working with people with OCD and anxiety since 2008. She works with adults, children, adolescents, so she has a wonderful span of knowledge. At the end of this episode, we talk about not only what to do if you think you might be struggling with OCD, but ways to support a partner if you believe your partner might be struggling, or what to look out for if you think your kids might be struggling. She's also the host of a podcast called All the Hard Things, so if you're curious in hearing more about different experiences with OCD, that's a great resource to listen to. There was so much I loved about this conversation. I loved her honesty about her own journey with postpartum OCD. She did a great job of describing the difference between generalized anxiety disorder, OCD, and quote, ordinary postpartum anxiety, but not to the level of a problem. She's such a wonderful mental health advocate, and I was really thankful she took this time to sit down with me. If you think you might be struggling with OCD, Jenna gives some wonderful resources at the end of the episode that are also in the show notes that you can look into. So let's do this. In research, have they found that the biggest deciding factor of if you're more prone to OCD is genetics or is it situational or experiential? Is there anything that is indicative of someone who may or may not be prone to OCD? So two really important things here. I think it's almost like two separate answers. So one, when it comes to OCD and also when it comes to just anxiety, social anxiety, other anxiety related conditions, we often find that as far as nature or nurture, it's actually an and both. So it's very much with OCD We do see that there is a predisposed kind of genetic predisposition. So more than likely someone who has OCD, they have some kind of lineage in their direct family, whether it's with their mom or their dad, their grandparents, Mm -hmm. some kind of related condition, if not OCD directly. So there is a definite genetic component. We know that from twin studies, but we also know from twin studies and other studies that it's not a definite. So if someone does have that genetic predisposition. It really does depend on their environment and their upbringing and the modeling of their close caregivers, right? So someone could certainly have that genetic predisposition, but if they have an environment that's not nurturing that and they have someone who doesn't maybe appear as anxious, you know, they're, they're working with people or they're observing people who live a very courageous life and they're kind of just living a life that they value, then those genes won't ever get expressed. They won't ever kind of get Mm. the light switch turned on. So OCD is really a loaded gun type of thing. Mm -hmm. So it's loaded and it's there because of the genetics, but their environment has a lot to do with whether that gun fires or not. But when it comes to risk factors, kind of what would make someone more likely to develop it than not, obviously from the previous point, we do have that genetic predisposition. And that's the case with a lot of mental health conditions, right? So depression, psychotic disorders, so on and so forth, if or substance use disorders, even if it's in your family, chances are you're more likely for a variety of reasons to express those tendencies. You're not bound to that by any means, but it is more likely than the average Joe or Jane. So definitely having it within your family or social support. So, you know, someone who doesn't have a good social support, maybe in school or in their workplace, they'd be more likely Mm -hmm. to develop these symptoms. Socioeconomic status for a variety of reasons has a lot to do with it. Obviously just access to care, so on and so forth. And then life transitions and hormonal changes, which is Mm -hmm. bringing us to this topic of moms, right? So research actually shows that becoming a new parent, especially becoming a new mom is in and of itself a risk factor for developing Mm -hmm. obsessive compulsive disorder. And I think that's really significant because they don't say that about a new job or divorce Mm -hmm. or the death of a loved one. It's kind of like 
yeah, stressful life situations and stressful life conditions can obviously exacerbate mental health problems, but becoming a mom in particular, that is such a strong, like exacerbation point for OCD that like it has Mm. its own separate indicator as being like, it's significant enough of a connection that it's known that we should look out for moms, but we don't look out for moms. (laughs) We should be, but we don't. Yeah, it's fascinating that, and it makes sense to me because you're all of a sudden it's stress, it's hormones. And it's like, you have this being that's completely under your care now that regardless of how you're incorporating it in, it's high stakes. So I, I, it makes sense that that would be a really triggering time, but it's wild to me that OCD in particular is not talked about that much when you're talking about maternal mental health or postpartum mental health. That was a perfect segue. So I'd love to launch into your story and hear a little bit about your experience with postpartum OCD. Absolutely. So like I said, going into parenthood, I knew I had been doing conferences for OCD. I had contributed to peer-reviewed literature reviews. Like I knew about OCD going into parenting. I, I knew about it. I knew that this is what postpartum OCD could look like. I knew that moms were more at risk of developing it. But I walked into motherhood almost, I wouldn't even say naive, I would say ignorance because Mm. I almost felt like, I remember thinking like, oh, I know what to do. I would never check him more than that. I Mm -hmm. would never do this. I would never have my husband do this for me Mm. out of anxiety. But you just never know until you're a mom. Like there's no way to prepare for that emotional intensity. Like there's nothing that anybody can say. There's no article that you could read, no video, no series of like come to Jesus talks from your best mom friends that will possibly prepare you for the experience of being a mom. Mm -hmm. And so I remember I didn't have, I didn't struggle at all throughout my pregnancy. And that's because again, I was very ignorant, like, oh yeah, I know all the things. It's not going to happen to me. I got it. I had a, what I would say is the traumatic delivery. I was in the hospital for several days. There were several instances where I thought that I was going to die and it was just awful. It, It was. I I didn't bond with my baby right away because of the traumatic nature of the delivery. I just wanted Mm -hmm. like to be left alone. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And I think that's important because it was really the first time where I was realizing like, this isn't all that people have cracked it up to be. Like I had all these expectations of like what delivery should look like and what labor should look like and what my, you know, first time holding my son should look like. And it was really like the darkening of the shades in that moment, like Mm -hmm. the dark cloud started everything was okay for a little bit. You know, we came home, I was with my husband, but when my husband went back to work, probably two or three weeks after my son was born, I remember my son was born in the winter. So I was like, we always needed to have socks on him. There was one time I remember exactly where I was, where most people can, when they kind of had Mm -hmm. that first intrusive thought that just like shatters them. It's like, they refer to it as the time my brain broke. Not that we think our brains are broken and I don't think my brain was broken. No one's broken, but that's what it feels like. Yeah. I remember going to put socks on my infant son. And I had this thought, what if I snap his ankles? Mm. And then I had the additional thought of like, why would you think that? Like, did you want Mm. to, like, was there a little Mm. part of you that actually wanted to do that? Like if you were mad enough or if you were tired enough, would you do that? And I freaked out. I remember like dropping the sock and just being like, throw my hands up. Like, no, I'm not doing it. I'm not going there. Like, I can't, I can't put those socks on him. And I remember I told my husband that he needed to do it just because that experience of being there and it was so dark, it felt so dark and it felt so real, Yeah, which is exactly what we talked about, right? Like Mm -hmm. it's not the presence of the intrusive thought that is the problem. It's your interpretation of it. So, you know, I, I, I could have gone one of two ways. I could have in that moment, witnessed that thought and allowed it to be there and recognize it as difficult, but allowed it to pass and continued to put the socks on my son anyway. But it felt so real and it was Mm -hmm. too hard. It was too hard for me. And I just remember saying the stakes are way too high. Like, I don't care. I don't care. I'm not doing it. Mm -hmm. I made that thought significant and I further, you know, took responsibility for that thought. What does that thought mean about me that I had that thought? What could I, could I ever do something like that? And then I further ritualized and gave into the cycle, making it worse by having my husband do it. So Mm -hmm. all of those things make it temporarily better, right? Like, oh, thank goodness. Thank goodness. I didn't have to put the socks on my son. Like I just didn't get to feel that anxiety anymore, which is temporarily relieving. But what it does is it just reinforces it for next time. 
Mm. So, you know, next time I would go to put socks on my son or to dress him or to do whatever, I would have that reinforcement from the previous time, right? I, it would be this, remember, you didn't do it last time, like good thing you didn't do it because you would have broken his ankles. Mm -hmm. So it's just all that much harder. And the way that OCD works is as you continue to avoid things and it's very insidious, right? So mm -hmm. it, it was never going to just be the socks, because I kept feeding that cycle, it ended up being his pants and his shirt. Mm. And suddenly I couldn't change his diaper. And then it just manifested and, and grew and grew and grew. By the time that my work had me back after three months of maternity leave, I, it was so bad that I was terrified of being alone with him. Mm. I was terrified of doing anything that I might have that thought again or similar thoughts. And then I started to have thoughts about like, what if you were so sleep deprived that you hurt him in the middle of the night and you don't remember? And it was always about this, like, are you actually losing your mind? Like, can you trust yourself? And, and yeah, I remember the two like episodes that really stand out to me are, there was one night where I, I swear it was for six hours straight where I just was obsessively like looking at my son to make sure that I didn't like throw him into the wall. Like mm. that there wasn't this like bloody gash on his head. Yeah. And it feels so ridiculous because like, I knew that there wasn't something there. Like I I'm not crazy, like, but it feels like you're going crazy. Right. And then as soon as I would check and I would see it with my eyes and I would rub it with my hands and make sure there wasn't blood on me, I would put him down. And then I would have this thought, well, are you sure that you checked everywhere? Mm. Are you sure that you checked enough? Or like, are you mm -hmm. sure that you're not so sleep deprived that you missed something? Is it too dark in this room that you could have missed something? And then I would get back up and do it again. And it got to the point where I had to wake my husband up in the middle of the night and have him check because mm -hmm. I was like, I have to sleep. And in hindsight, obviously that's the worst thing that you can do, but it was really bad. It was yeah. really, really, really bad. And the thing that actually got me to the point where I was like, I need help. Like, I can't do this anymore. It's just going to get worse and worse was I would get to the point where I would be afraid again, that I was so sleep deprived that I, I would leave him in a grocery store somewhere and not remember. I would bring him to the grocery store. I would put him in the car seat and I would, mm -hmm. I would have that thought, like, did I leave him at the grocery store? And I just like, made that up. Like, am I dreaming? Am I having like mm. a daydream that I, I daydreamed putting him in the car seat? And so I would look in the rearview mirror just really quickly as a check. Oh yeah, he's there. But then I would doubt, are you that sleep deprived that you made right. that up too? And so I got to the point where I would have to physically pull over in the middle, like on the side of the highway multiple times to like actually click him out of his car seat and like physically hold him. And I remember pulling over one day and just being like, like, this is only going to get worse. This yeah. is only, this is not going to get any better doing the things that I'm doing. Like, this is only, this started with a sock. Right. And, and I just like, couldn't handle the vision of like where this could go. And so I, I remember thinking like, I have all the knowledge. Like, I know that this is OCD. I know what I should be doing. And I know that there's an element of this that is like explained by OCD, but so many women don't know that. And mm -hmm. how do they not hurt themselves? Which obviously so sometimes they do. Yeah. But yeah. I can't, I'm stunned at how so many women without my knowledge and without my context for what OCD is, I'm stunned. Like I am amazed at how women, I'm sad for them, but I'm also like, how are you still here? Yeah. Yeah. I don't get it. It's no. so hard. It takes a lot of strength. It takes a lot of strength to go through it. It takes a lot of strength to get to, you know, whatever healing starts to look like for you. And, you know, in what you were talking about that, when you said that trusting yourself element that really stood out to me, because I think that's the trick a little bit of OCD where it's like, I know I'm sane. I, I know I'm, you know, okay. But then my feelings are so pervasive that I just I don't know, can I trust myself? And that's such a scary place to start to move into. And I think that as you're saying too, if you don't know that like checking is an OCD thing, it's not just about, again, washing your hands or the basic things we think of, then I think you can really start to feel like you're losing touch with reality. And so those resources are so, so, so important. In starting to reach out, what did that process look like for you? My only regret was really, not getting help sooner. Like, mm -hmm. I, I don't know what the holdback was for me, but I do remember telling my husband 
because he really wanted me to see somebody. I remember telling him like, if I had time to go to a therapy session, when an hour a week, I would shower, right? Like I think as a new mom, <laughs> mm-hmm. there are so many barriers, right? Like you don't have time. Like we don't have time to do all the things that we need to do all of the things that are on our mental load Mm -hmm. and take care of ourselves and go to therapy. Like there, I remember very vividly thinking like, I don't need therapy. I need a shower, which is so Mm -hmm. not true. Right. Like Mm -hmm. so not true in hindsight, but it it was a lot of barriers and it was a a lot of barriers of like, well, what am I going to do with my son for that hour when I'm actually in therapy? And unfortunately so many women, it's, it's an issue of the cost and all that stuff. But yeah, so I, I did eventually go to my OBGYN. And the frustrating part is that my OBGYN knew my background. She knew I'm in a small community. She knew that I was an OCD treatment provider. She knew that I was esteemed and, you know, professional and and knowledgeable about this area. And so when I told her what I was struggling with and being very specific, like, these are my obsessions. These are my compulsions. It's taking more than an hour. a day. like basically diagnosing myself for her. Mm -hmm. She essentially said, welcome to new motherhood. Like this is just part of the game now. And she made some comment about how, like, you just need to stop being so hard on yourself. Like if your son wants a pacifier, just give it to him. And I remember like, I wanted to just jump across the table and like attack her because I was like, that's so invalidating. That's so Mm -hmm. incredibly invalidating. Like I know what it is that I'm struggling with, but how many women don't? And like, how many women are going to take your advice and take your response and walk out the door thinking like, this is just my life now. I I guess I just need to stop being so hard on myself. Like it's ridiculous. And it's so incredibly frustrating. So then I had, I'm bold and I'm an advocate and so many other women aren't. And so I feel for them. And this is why I do what I do, like to try to empower them and equip them with the information to go into these meetings and to go into these discussions. But I was very clear in saying, I cry every single night in the shower. Mm. I hate my life. I don't want to be around my baby because it's so anxiety provoking for me. And I have had thoughts of hurting myself. Mm. How do I get you to take me seriously? Like, why do I have to talk to you about that? Why do I have to go there with you before you take me seriously? And so then she was like, okay, okay, here's a list of 10 therapists. And I was like, okay, that's exactly what I want to do right now. I really (laughs) want to go. And like with my baby, with all of the symptoms I have, I really want to go home and look one by one at all of these therapists and all it's like, so I finally did find one who was really, really helpful. The waiting list was six weeks. I needed help like a year ago. (laughs) Yeah. I can't wait six weeks. Like I honestly, I remember thinking like, I don't know if I'll make it through the weekend. Like I need to see someone. And luckily, like I'm a therapist. So I knew what to say and I knew who to talk to and I knew how to get myself in sooner. But again, so many women don't know that they don't know what to do. Right. And then the last frustrating piece, which I'm sure every woman would would go through and will continue to go through until we just get mightier and mightier. Uh Uh-huh. I continued to know, and like, this is exactly what it is that I'm struggling with. They give me the Edinburgh depression scale, Mm. which is, I'm sure every woman, every mom is very familiar with the scale. It seems to be the only thing that we give moms. We give it to them at best six weeks postpartum when you go Mm -hmm. and get a checkup to make sure that you can have sex again. But here's this (laughs) Edinburgh depression scale. It's very face valid, which means that you obviously know what they're assessing. Like it's, it's really blunt and scary, right? Like how depressed do you feel? How much do you (laughs) cry? Have you ever wanted to hurt your baby? Have you ever wanted to hurt yourself? And it's like, no woman is going to fill that out, honestly, and then give it back to like Mm -hmm. Miss Secretary behind the desk. And even if it wasn't such an awful scale in and of itself, why are we only assessing for depression? So that's the last frustrating piece is that I very clearly was struggling like a slam dunk case of postpartum OCD. And they still just gave me the Edinburgh depression scale. And I said, if you give me this and just this, I'm not going to score because I'm not depressed. Right. I have postpartum OCD and I need you to give me the dimensional OCD scale or the Yale Brown obsessive compulsive scale or that like, why do I need to tell you how to do your job? (laughs) Yeah. It's just wild that that's not accessible, especially as you're saying, is it being a pretty common reaction mentally to being postpartum? So for somebody who's not a therapist and doesn't have all this knowledge at their disposal, 
Do you have any suggestions for what advocating for yourself can look like? Because I think we hear so often like advocate for yourself. You're the only one who can really speak to your own health. And, and we hear the importance of that and it's great, but we also don't know what we don't know. And we're conditioned, unfortunately, in society generally to stereotype gender as women to be polite and not push if we get pushed back on, which I think we're breaking wonderfully, but we still have some work to do on that category. So what are your thoughts on advocacy for yourself? So I think listening to content like this is really the first step and just feeling like really armed and sure about what is going on and like feeling more confident about you know, what the heck is going on? And this really resonated with me and I'm not crazy. I'm not alone because I think that's really the first barrier is like, you just feel so alone. And my only hope is that by doing these podcasts, by providing the content that I I do on Instagram and otherwise is like, Mm -hmm. I want people in their cars to be like, oh my God, that's me. Oh my God. Like I thought that I thought I was the only one. Like I want that click and light bulb moment for someone. And so I think, you know, just becoming educated and learning more about it for your own benefit Mm -hmm. so that you don't feel so crazy is the first step. The next step is to get therapy. Like yesterday, we really Mm -hmm. need to like, you need a shower and you need therapy, right? Like Mm -hmm. you you need time to, to, to sort this out, to talk to your doctors. So, but as far as like equipsness to go into these sessions with your doctor or with your OBGYN. I would be very clear about what it is that you're struggling with. And Mm -hmm. I would unfortunately brace yourself unless you have a rockin' doctor, unless you have someone who is fortunately very like open to these discussions and alert themselves of it and knowledgeable of it. I would just arm yourself and brace yourself for the worst that they're probably not going to understand. They're probably going to invalidate you. They're probably going to be very dismissive because we're dismissive of moms in general as a society. Mm. We really only care about the baby. We don't care about moms. Moms can figure it out. And so just, just know that like, don't set yourself up for any like wild Um, optimistic expectations. Just know that you're probably going to have to advocate for yourself. And that's not a problem with you. It's a problem with how we treat moms. It's a problem with the medical system in general. We don't know enough about OCD, especially in the postpartum phase, right? Like we just, anything is wrong. Depression. Oh, that, that that mom has postpartum. Like, what does that even mean? Anyway, right. So above and beyond like educating yourself, bracing yourself for them to dismiss you, to not understand. I would also brace yourself for having to describe the fact that you don't want these thoughts Mm -hmm. because unfortunately so many women go and they say that they've had thoughts of harming their baby, or they have thoughts about this or that they don't want the thoughts. Mm -hmm. So that's another really big, important piece that I haven't emphasized enough, right? Which is that OCD is about ego dystonic thoughts. Ego dystonic means that it's inconsistent with your character. It's inconsistent with your values. I didn't, Mm. when I had that thought about my son and snapping his ankles, I wasn't like, oh yeah, get him, like get him. Mm -hmm. He deserves it. I was like, oh my God, what? No. Oh my God. This is the worst thing I could think of. This is the worst thing. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's ego dystonic. Ego syntonic is where we're thinking of more like psychosis, right? Like where they're actually kind of fantasizing about the thoughts. They want to pursue the thought. They're more Mm. curious about it and it's more aligned with their values. And so that's the differentiating factor between like OCD unwanted thoughts and someone who actually like does harm their children and does want to harm their children. There's want versus unwanted. Right. And so unfortunately, again, medical professionals don't know this because they don't do enough work or, or studying or knowledge about or teaching about OCD. I, I had this thought that I like snap, I could snap my baby's ankles. Like mm-hmm. I, I'm not surprised at all that, that I wouldn't be, have been surprised at all in hindsight. If my doctor would have asked me like, well, do you actually want to, and like call child right. protective services, right? Right. I worked with so many women, unfortunately, and it breaks my heart who have slam dunk, very like line by line cases of postpartum OCD. And they were sent inpatient. They were sent like Mm. to be away from their baby, to be like held in some institution because they're having these unwanted thoughts. And it's like, no, they don't want these thoughts. It's obsessive compulsive disorder. Right. So if there's one word that you take with you into these appointments with your doctor, it's ego dystonic. I don't want these thoughts. 
They're not consistent with my character. I do not want these thoughts. They're the worst thing that I could ever be having. And that is very consistent with OCD. They're OCD unwanted thoughts. They are not wanted. So if, if there's one word that you get out of this whole entire podcast, it's ego dystonic. That's fantastic. Thank you so much yeah. for underlining. Because I also, I think you said at the top, OCD has a way of attaching itself to the things you love and care about the most. And so I think that is really important because it does prevent you from even wanting to speak what's going on with you because you go, well, I don't want people to think I want this. And like that, it just perpetuates the whole OCD cycle, I think. So I think that's so important to reiterate. Thank you. Yeah. You gave a great example of if these thoughts are taking up or this OCD experience is taking up more than an hour a day and some other kind of markers for when to know it might be OCD. I think it can be a little muddy sometimes to navigate like what is appropriate anxiety postpartum? What is postpartum anxiety? What is postpartum OCD? Until it gets to like a really heightened point. Do you have any thoughts on how to kind of check in with yourself and figure out like, where do I where do I land today? Or is this mentally healthy, the place I'm in right now? Or do I need to reach out for help or look for something else? Absolutely. So I think this is a really common question, you know, one, which what's the difference between anxiety and OCD? This is one of my favorite topics would have to be its own like episode in <laughs> itself. But at the end of the day, it's tomato, tomato. Mm-hmm. They work through the same cycles. They are established by the same cycles. According to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, generalized anxiety disorder tends to be about like more down to earth topics like Mm -hmm. bills and life and the future and well-being. Whereas OCD, according to the DSM, at least tends to be about like more irrational things. But in this day and age, it's like not everything is that irrational, right? Like worrying about your kids getting shot is not that irrational. Like it's actually kind of a legitimate worry. Yeah. Yeah. Which is horrifying. So it, it's like, we're not going to change someone's treatment plan based on like the outlandishness of their thoughts. Like it's the same pattern. It's the same things that kind of, you know, manifest. It's, it's, it, it doesn't matter. The treatment is the same too. So the only differentiating way that I have really found that helps me describe the difference between generalized anxiety disorder and OCD, like functionally, is that anxiety tends to feel like this like thunderstorm in the background, like this just is like gray cloud. It's like not immediately threatening, but it's always there and kind of looming in the background. Whereas OCD tends to feel like a lightning bolt, like it's sudden Mm. and it's harsh and it's emergent and it's just awful, really, really tight, like very specified. Right. But then as far as like what's normal anxiety versus or obsessive compulsiveness versus what's disordered, it would be back to those issues of distress and impairment, right? So essentially, Mm. like if you're okay and your family's okay with how things are going and you're checking your baby a couple of times at night, but you're okay with that and it's not inhibiting your values and you feel like I prefer to do those things versus need to do those things, then maybe that's fine for you. Like you have a system that works for you and that's great, you know, distress and impairment. But if you feel like it is becoming like a need versus just a want, like Mm -hmm. I need to go and check my baby. I can't not check him one more time. I need to check him one more time. Otherwise X, Y, Z, then that's becoming probably a little bit more problematic, just where it becomes like much more urgent of a situation, just more, more of an emergency type of situation where it may be a little bit more abnormal because yeah, things like checking your baby at night, especially when they're a newborn, like that's going to happen. But it, it, we need to come up with a plan and stay committed to that plan and not go above that plan. The best example I could give is when I work with people who have contamination fears and OCD, mm-hmm. right? Like, especially with COVID, some of their fears were legitimate. Like, right. I, I, we kind of had to, like, shift our understanding of all of that. But my take on how to handle that was always, then you need to follow the CDC, You need to follow the CDC, and those are the only guidelines that you should follow. Not the CDC, plus what Grandpa Joe, plus what the guy at the grocery store says, plus what you heard on this podcast, plus what you are are just a little bit more, right? Like, come up with a plan, stick with the plan, and not an inch more. So, you know, with the contamination example, I always say, you know, if CDC says to wash your hands for 20 minutes, OCD owns the minute or 
<laughs> CDC says to wash your hands for 20 seconds. OCD mm-hmm. owns the 21st second. So like mm-hmm. pick a plan and, and stick with it. Right. So, you know, we don't have anything like that for women or for new moms, but coming up with a plan and sticking to it. If, if like me, it's the socks and then it's the pants and then it's the shirt. And then it's, I can't dress. like, you can see how it kind of snowballs. Right. So if you are in the situation where you feel like it's snowballing, it's going to continue to snowball <laughs> unless you can come up with a plan and just stick to that plan. That's great. And then with the help of somebody, I I would assume or advocate for what helps, like, what is the method you mentioned? Exposure and response prevention. Exposure and response prevention. You mentioned that as a help, helpful treatment for OCD. Will you talk a little bit about what that is and why it works? Absolutely. So exposure and response prevention, otherwise known as ERP, is we call it kind of the gold standard treatment for OCD, anxiety, and related conditions. So what that means is it's just an evidence-based treatment. It is by far, it has more research and more support than any other treatment for any other disorder. Mm -hmm. And it is more effective, in fact, for OCD and anxiety than any other treatment for any other disorder. So when we say gold standard, it's basically our way of saying like, this is by far your best bet. Obviously, nothing is perfect when we're talking about humans and mental health. Obviously, nothing is perfect, but like we put our bets big time on exposure and response prevention. So exposure and response prevention really has two elements to it. It's essentially our two-part solution for a two-part problem. So the Mm two-part problem being obsessions and compulsions in OCD, exposure and response prevention you know, we have exposures and then we have response prevention. So exposures would be our way of, you know, in therapy, we work with the person in this situation with the mom to identify small and challenging, but still manageable ways that she can put herself gradually more and more outside of her comfort zone. So if there are things that she was avoiding, like me and dressing my son, maybe putting on the socks were too difficult at first because it just felt more fragile. Maybe it was easier to put a coat on him probably not going to like snap an ankle that way. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, if putting on a coat at that point in my situation was challenging, but manageable for me, maybe like a three on the, on a zero to 10 scale, zero, not being very anxiety provoking at all. 10 being the most anxiety provoking thing you could possibly imagine. Mm -hmm. I would start there and that would be my exposure. Right. And so what you do is you do this exposure. So you put the coat on Eli and you keep putting the coat on Eli. And after you do that several times, you learn, you habituate, which is essentially a fancy way for saying that you get used to it. And you also learn, huh, I've been putting the coat on him. I haven't been breaking any of his bones. My worst Mm -hmm. fear must not be as catastrophic as I think. It must also not be Mm -hmm. as probable as I think, right? Mm-hmm. And so by working on the coat, maybe then that, that eventually gets so easy that it's kind of boring. And then I can move on to his shirt and then I can move on to his pants and then I can move on to his socks such that by the time I'm working on the socks, it's not actually as hard as it would have been in the beginning, right? Because I've kind mm-hmm. of built my way up to it. But the most important part with exposures is that you're just doing these small, challenging, but manageable things that are a little bit outside of your comfort zone. So finding these ways to face your fear essentially, mm-hmm. but then it's also, it's equally important if not even more important to resist the rituals. So it would not have been effective for me to put socks on my son and then ask my husband, are you sure that I did that? Okay. Like, are you sure he's okay? Are you sure I didn't break his ankles? Mm -hmm. It would not have been enough for me to put my son down at night and then just check him to make sure he didn't have a gashing wound on his head. Like that's Mm -hmm. no different. That's no different from what I was doing. Right. So you need to do the scary thing and stop doing the safety behavior or the compulsion that you would normally do to make yourself feel better. You know, in the example of the hand washing, it's just a more tactile kind of example for people. You touch the dirty thing and you resist washing your hands. If you touch the dirty thing, but then you go and wash your hands again, you're not doing anything differently than what you've always done. So exposures Mm -hmm. are really, they put you in a position where you should practice not doing your safety safety behaviors. And so throughout all of that, you just habituate, you get used to it. You learn that your fears aren't as likely or as probable or as catastrophic as you think they are. And you also gain confidence. You, you gain a lot is what I'll say. When you're going through it and you're in the kind of height of OCD, I think it feels almost unimaginable that you could live any other way because it feels so oppressive So I'm wondering where you are now. Have you been able to find balance? Do you still struggle? What is your experience? I'm never going to not have intrusive thoughts. 
I'm never going to be like a super chill person. I've never (laughs) been though. And I, I feel like sometimes people want that. Like they just want to have no anxiety. Like they just want to almost like dig this piece of themselves out of their brain. But it's like, we can't get rid of that dark piece of us without also sacrificing some of the good. Like Mm. I'm also a really creative person, Mm -hmm. right? Like I I have really awesome dreams. I also have really awful nightmares. Like I I can't get Mm. rid of one and, and keep the other. And so what recovery looks like to me And it's only this great because I literally live the lifestyle of ERP. Like if Mm -hmm. something triggers me, I go at it head on. If I feel like I'm trying to like retreat or avoid something, I go at it head on. Mm -hmm. Recovery for me looks like I spend even more time now with my son alone than I think like most parents do. Like every month or Mm -hmm. every six weeks, we specifically like I'll take him alone. Just the two of us, like we'll pick a random place in Wisconsin and go to and pick a hotel, go to the zoo. That started out as an exposure for me, like to Mm -hmm. be alone with him for an entire weekend. Mm -hmm. But I've done it so much and I I feel like I just want to make up for lost time a little bit. Like I can really value and appreciate the fact that like I get to spend time with him now because I remember not even being able, like my husband would say that he had to go to the bathroom or take a shower and my heart would drop because Mm -hmm. I didn't want to be alone with my son for even just two minutes. Right. And so like, I really hold that close to my chest. Like that's very, very special to me that I can go out to eat with my son or that I can be alone with him on a weekend when my husband goes and flies home to Pennsylvania to be with his family. Like, yeah, I know a lot of women can just do that. No problem. But it's, it was hard for me. It was really hard for me. And that's special to me now, but it's hard. Like every once in a while, things do come up, things do come up you know, we only have one because of all the issues that I've gone through. And so Mm. every once in a while, I have these intrusive thoughts of like, is he going to grow up and be a psychopath because he's an only child? Like, is he going to da da da? So every once in a while, and it's the doubt disorder, right? It's just doubt. It comes up in so many different ways. So anytime that like, like any four-year-old, he throws a temper tantrum and we have to turn off the video games or turn off the TV. I'm like, oh my God, like, what are we doing to him? We're totally messing him up. Like he's going to grow up and be a psychopath. Like, what is he going to do? And that's going to be my fault. And it's just harm in a different way, right? Like it's the same thing, but I try to, in those moments, instead of like reassurance seeking from my husband, like, do you think that we handled that the right way? Like, do you think he's okay? I recognize where this is going. Like I can see this very clearly as just the doubt disorder. Yeah. And I just do whatever I can to not answer those questions. Like I know that that's not leading me anywhere good. And yeah, like it it just comes to really committing to the process. Like I obsessed for a very long time about because he is my only child. I obsessed for a very long time about whether he would die before me. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I spent a lot of time like researching legitimate like statistics on like how likely is it that children will outlive their parents or vice versa and I would like watch these TED talks of women who lost their babies and like did all these wonderful motivational speeches in their honor and Mm -hmm. it's like I'm never gonna know 100% if he's gonna live or die before like I there's nothing out there there's not there's no like article there's no look into the future there's nothing that a doctor could tell me that like, yes, your son will not die before you. Like, I I have to live with that. We all have to live with that. You have to live with that. My neighbor has to, like, we all have to live with that. Yeah. It just comes to this realization that like, I'm not going to get what I want, which is hundred percent certainty. So I have to go with the next best thing, which is rolling the dice, just like the rest of us. (laughs) Like, yeah, but yeah, recovery is great, but it's only because like, I fully embrace this as a lifestyle and I'm really consistent with not doing my safety behaviors. And if something scares me, I go out of my way to do it. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Therapist told me that anxiety was like trying to figure out something you can't, you'll never know the answer to You can't yeah. figure out And OCD looks for certainty or looks for that safety and that, you know, something to hold on to, but you can't find it because it doesn't exist. And so there's a huge process of getting comfortable with discomfort, I think in navigating anxiety or OCD. Totally. Do you have any quick thoughts on just being comfortable in the discomfort? Because I think that can be a huge barrier to taking that next step. Something that we say a lot, like one of the terms that is kind of thrown around a lot is to sit with the uncertainty, sit with the uncertainty, Mm. sit with the discomfort. 
But what I like to say instead, and I, I forget who coined this. I don't know if it was Jonathan Abramowitz or Jonathan Grayson, like pioneers in the OCD world, but somewhere along the lines, someone told me, instead of saying sit with it, we should really be saying act with uncertainty. Because what mm-hmm. that is, is like, we continue to do the things that we want to do on a day-to-day basis that we would want to do if OCD or anxiety wasn't part of the picture. We just bring that along with us, right? So mm. I took my son to school today. And like most parents, they probably had an intrusive thought of like, what if today's the day? Like, what if right. I should keep my son home today from a shooter happening or, or something awful happening? Yeah. And every time I think about it, like that's uncertain. Like, unfortunately, I don't know hundred percent, but I have to do this podcast, right? I have to do my job. I have Mm -hmm. to do the things that lead me to a life of value and that I feel good about. And I can't let my world stop because of that anxiety or because of that discomfort. So Mm -hmm. I would instead encourage people to consider acting with uncertainty or acting with discomfort. Like don't allow that discomfort, like don't hold your breath to wait for the discomfort to go away because it won't, Mm -hmm. it will more likely go away if you continue your day and bring it with you which I know is kind of like a paradoxical and radical concept. Like, how do I just move on with my day? But small steps, right? Like if you can't get out of bed, like maybe move your toes. Like it's literally, it's small steps. It's small steps, whatever is challenging, but manageable. And it's hard, but listening to this podcast is a great first step. That's awesome. Thank you. If you do have a partner, obviously your partner is not accountable for you doing these behaviors, your health, your recovery, anything. But if you are a partner listening and it sounds familiar from that perspective, what is something you can do to support the person who's going through OCD or anxiety? The first thing that comes to mind is, you know, like I like that you use the word support because that's really what it's all about. So my husband in that, in those situations, he should not have put the socks on my son because even though it probably felt like in that moment that he was helping me. And even though like as loved ones, we feel like we're taking away their discomfort, we're doing something good. Mm -hmm. And my husband didn't have this as his intention, but by taking over the responsibility of the socks, he unknowingly reinforced the obsession that I can't be trusted to do it and that it's not okay for me to do it. Right. Otherwise, why would he have done it? So, and I know that's not our intention, but that's how our brains register it. Mm -hmm. And so it's really important to learn how to support your loved one without accommodating the OCD. So loved ones, family members, 95 to 99% of loved ones admit that they accommodate the OCD. Accommodations are just a fancy way of saying that we change or modify our own behavior in response to someone else's OCD requests or demands. So my husband putting on the socks for my child, that was an accommodation. So we all do it, but it works just like any other ritual. So my first recommendation is always like, First of all, I would say go to iocdf.org. That's the International OCD Foundation. There's a lot Mm. of good resources on there for people who are supporting someone who has OCD. So lots of really good support on like what support looks like versus accommodating the OCD. But first things first, I would just say to your loved one, you know, like I've been reading a little bit more about this. Like I know that you're really struggling in those moments. Like I feel like by putting on Eli's socks. I know it probably feels like it's helping in that moment, but based on what I've been reading, you know, it feels like that's, that actually is probably not what I should be doing. And it's actually making things worse. So I just want to let you know, because I love you so much. I want to work with you on a plan to not do that anymore. So like Mm. by this time, like, I'm not going to do that anymore because I love you and I don't want to make this worse for you. And those conversations can be hard to have. And then the only other resource that I have that comes to mind right away is no CD does, they're called no CD 411 sessions. They're like education sessions for loved ones. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So if someone is like really struggling and wants like a therapist personalized touch on like, these are the accommodations that you're doing. This is how you can talk to your loved one about not doing Mm -hmm. it. This is how you can support them instead. It's not therapy, but it's like, okay, this is what you need to do. And and you can ask Mm -hmm. all the questions that you have about OCD, obviously, and they're there for you. But that's obviously really helpful because You can hear all the things online, but OCD is very nuanced. And if someone feels like they need that personalized touch, like someone who actually is digging in and understanding their unique situation, no CD offers, like I said, those no CD 411 sessions for family members. If we start to see what looks like anxiety or OCD in our kids, what should we be looking for? How should we act? What do we do to best support them? Kids are tricky because... 
obviously like it's wired within us as parents to want to get rid of and just absorb their discomfort. Right. So if they're anxious, we want to tell them that everything is okay. If they Mm -hmm. ask us to wash our hands because things are dirty, you know, we would just want to like take it all on. We want to take it all on for them. So that's tricky when it becomes, you know, a problem when it's actually anxiety and OCD, we're going to work with the family member to reduce again, those accommodations. So You know, if little Joey asks mom to wash his hands, mom isn't going to wash her hands anymore. Mm. And Joey's going to be really upset about that, right? Joey's not going to like that because Joey's, especially being a kid, he's not going to understand. So yeah, it's just really, really tricky. Again, I would recommend the resources that I said before, Mm -hmm. but an additional resource for kids is Natasha Daniels. So Natasha Mm -hmm. Daniels is kind of like one of the experts in pediatric OCD and um, parenting kids who have OCD. So Natasha Daniels. Daniels has a really wonderful resource. I think her website is anxioustoddlers.com. And she also has a podcast with a ton okay. of information about how family members can help their children in a way that's supportive, but doesn't make the OCD worse. You also are an incredible resource, especially with some of your focus for these listeners on postpartum OCD. Where can people find you? I am over on Instagram mostly. So my Instagram handle is Jenna.overba. That's typically where you'll find me, but I also have my own podcast. It's called all the hard things. So if you are resonating with anything that we've talked about, especially as a mom, I did a really cool, I called it an anonymous series where I had moms come on and basically anonymously talk to me about all their deep, dark, intrusive thoughts. So um, if you need a place to like hear someone else's raw experience, that's a really great place. And then I'm also over at no CD. So if you need an education session or if you need a therapist, then no CD is also a really great resource. That's N O C D.com. Great. And actually one more question is no CD, the place to go. If you decide that you as a postpartum mom do you have some of these symptoms? Is that like a great first resource or is yes. there another? Okay, great. So no CD is a great resource for any, anyone out there who is struggling with OCD and anxiety. So obviously we offer therapy to the people who have OCD. We can do mm-hmm. a diagnosis and all that stuff, but we do also offer those sessions for family members, but for moms, for anyone who signs up, you get access to a ton of support groups and we have actually a bunch of support groups for moms in particular. So that's great. Yeah. So there's something special about the mom community, like, you know, and obviously I'm biased, but when it comes to other forms of OCD, right, like we benefit from that social support, but I feel like moms in particular, just because, Mm. you know, there's so, there's an added layer of shame and guilt and being a bad mom and feeling like you're messing your kids up. And it's just really helpful and validating to hear that you're not the only mom out there who's struggling with this stuff. Like I could learn all the things about OCD go through all the exposures. But at the end of the day, like, I feel like what was most helpful was actually hearing other accounts from other women who had the same thoughts that I had, Mm. like just the alleviation of that fear that I'm crazy and that there's something wrong with me. Like that was the most helpful. And so surrounding yourself with other moms who are, you know, safe and, and who might be willing to talk about it. And that's a great place to find those people is at those support groups that OCD offers. That's awesome. Yeah, just knowing you're not alone and you're not weird and you're not bad is just so reassuring yeah, in the right absolutely. way. <laughs> yeah, in That's the best wonderful. way. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's fantastic. Well, thank you so much for this conversation. I feel like this has been so informative, just lots of gems for mindfulness and, and figuring out how to navigate some of these really vulnerable places. So I really, really appreciate your time and thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of Week by Week. Please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcast. Follow us on Instagram at Week by Week Podcast and visit our blog at weekbyweekpodcast.com. Check out the show notes for more information about our guests and additional resources I used in reference during this episode. This podcast was produced during the COVID-19 pandemic and recorded remotely. Our show today was produced by me, Celeste Busa, Dave Hill, and Douglas Serine, and produced and edited by Colleen Beasley. Week by Week is a Gumption Pictures production.